Hey everyone, and welcome to the Shanty Show. Uh, we got a couple guests joining us today. We've got Ian Robb and James Stevens. They've got a new album out called Declining with Thanks. It's a mix of uh, folk songs, traditional folk songs, composed songs, and of course, uh, a few songs of the sea. So we thought it'd be really fun to just get on Zoom with them and, and have a chat and have them play us some songs. We covered a lot of ground in this conversation. Yeah, one of the things we're talking about is how folk music and music in general reflects the time period that the music emerges from. And in this particular episode, we talked a, a fair bit about politics, how they've changed since the 1960s or so. And incidentally, uh, they're both sort of based in and around the Ottawa area, but I noticed they're in, in Chelsea, Quebec uh, this weekend. Yeah, I wonder why they would want to get out of Ottawa. Mm. I'm not uh, sure. We also talk a little bit about um, about the folk scene uh, in Toronto in the in the 70s and you know Ian's experiences moving from the UK and being part of what he calls the folk scare there uh, coming to Toronto and not knowing what to expect and finding a really rich community of of singers and musicians um, and becoming family well um, I guess let's just get right into it let's do it to me Waiting for the turning of the tide Heave away, me Johnnies Heave away And then me girls were bound away On a sweet and a westerly wind Heave away, me Johnny boys We're all bound to go there's some of us bound for New York town And there's some of us bound for France Heave away, me Johnnies Heave away And there's some of us bound for Bengal Bay Just to teach the whales a dance Heave away, me Johnny boys we're all bound to go So fare you well, you Kingston girls Farewell to St Andrew's Dock Heave away Johnny's heave away And if ever we return again We will make your cradles rock Heave away, me Johnny boys We're all bound to go So come all of you odd weather sailing men that round the Cape of Storms Heave away, me Johnnies Heave away Don't forget your boots and your oilskins, boys Or you'll wish that you'd never been born Heave away, me Johnny boys We're all bound to go don't forget your boots and your royal skins, boys, or you'll wish that you'd never been born. Heave away, me Johnny boys. We're all bound to go. Awesome. Well, Ian and James, we are thrilled to have you joining us all the way from not our nation's capital, Chelsea, Quebec. Um, and just tell us a little bit about that song, and uh, and I know you said you mentioned it uh, that you got that off Enoch Kent. That's correct. Yeah, the great Enoch Kent. I learned a, a bunch of songs from him, but that's probably the only one that's really survived in my repertoire. And um, it's a kind of an unusual version of that particular song, and it, and I really uh, I, I really like the, the the whole pulse of it and the and the melody of it, and it, you know it. It works as as a as a great song. Now, never mind a shanty. It doesn't have to be a shanty, really. It's been a common theme for us on a number of these shows that you know you know yes, these shanties have a long, rich tradition and their work songs and all this kind of stuff. But 
they're just great songs to sing. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit in the context of your new album, uh, Declining with Thanks, because it's a really great mix of, of songs, but there's actually a, you know, I, I don't think you'd describe yourself necessarily as a shanty singer, but there are quite a lot of nautical, themey songs on there. How, how do you go about sort of, you know, picking the songs that are going to, that you want to stick with, that are going to, going to fit? <laughs> um, it, it, I don't know. It's it's a very organic process. I don't I don't really have a process. In fact, it's just the, these things just kind of come together. And you know, there's a couple of sort of themes in in this album. Um, and one of them is uh, you know men joining the army or the navy, and and it, perhaps against their will, uh, perhaps you know for for circumstances that are beyond their control. And it's something that's often kind of, it's kind of fascinated me as to, you know, the reasons that men actually end up going to war uh, or, or just joining the forces. And um, so that's, that's one theme. There's a number of songs that, towards the beginning of the album that deal with that in various ways. Um, and, and the other one is uh, actually death and, and uh, you know, declining years because, uh, you know, I'm in my 70s now and, and these things are always at the, uh, you know, always in your mind. Uh, and um, I don't know, it's just, uh, I, I just came, came together with a, a whole bunch of songs that happened to, ha to have death. And then there's a few others that have nothing to do with either of those, uh, those themes. So it's not really a thematic record, but it just kind of came out that way. To touch on those two themes that you just brought up, um, I was having to listen to the album today, and it's a really beautiful mix of, of songs and, and, um, and lyrical material. And then that dead funny song comes around, second last song. There's a lot to be said for ending up dead. No need to fear that long sleep. For one thing's for sure, your woes will be your courtesy of the grim reaper. You'll no longer be here in this sad veil of tears. No need to keep up your resistance, for you won't be there or indeed anywhere, unaware of your own non existence. So rattle your bones and join in the chorus Death's round the corner and he's coming for us He drink and be merry while you're alive Cause we've all got a date with the guy with the scythe um, And it almost strikes me as it, it reminded me a little bit of Monty Python uh, um, Always look on the bright side of life kind of thing So have, just having a laugh about it um about the meeting yeah, we all have a meeting with the the man with the side so I, I thought that was very funny it's a great song uh, it really is and i like the placement of it um in the album too after a lot of sort of heavy thematical uh heavy themed material um to go back to the theme of, of sort of men being uh, enlisted sometimes against their own will you have daft annie there which talks about um not only the press gang but the press gang actually being sent after a young man because there's a wealthy a uh, fellow that's after uh, a woman that's in love with him. Um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. You brought in a few different sort of ideas there and, and there's sort of a, a societal commentary there, um, which I, I, I was talking to Stefan a little bit about before. It's interesting. I feel that music reflects society and that's, that, that's a theme that I think was a lot more prevalent in previous generations of uh, you know true love overcoming finances or the lack of financial stability, if you will. And that's something that, that sort of seems absent in our, in our culture nowadays. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think it goes back uh, certainly to all the, you know, the really old classical balladry. Um, uh, these kind of themes cropped up a lot. And I think some of them perhaps more recent songs, and I'm not talking about recent in this century or even last century, but you know, the, the ones w that we know the era that they came out of. Um, a lot of them borrow those themes, and and this particular song, Daft Annie, that you're talking about, certainly borrows a lot. There was a lass of Ellen Town, and oh, but she was fair. Of all the flowers in nature's bloom, no beauty shone more rare. She was courted by a gentleman. With gold and silver bright, but she loved a lad, a farmer's son, who was her heart's delight. 
I mean, I, I, I call it a fake folk song because um, <laughs> one of my uh, musical heroes, Peter Bellamy, always referred to his own songs as fake folk songs, and he wrote some really good ones. Um, and so it is a fake folk song, you know, but it's, but it's also a kind of a continuation of the line of the themes uh, of the stories, you know, because, I mean, they say that there's only a handful of stories in cl the whole realm of classical balladry. Um, there are only certain basic stories that you can tell, and, and they're all variations on those themes. I mean, as far as um, kind of the the the, uh, the the justice the social justice end of uh, of this stuff it it comes out time and time again because these songs came from people who were generally not privileged mm. you know and and sometimes uh, there's a lot of feminist stuff going goes on too uh, again because women were you know not privileged generally at least the ones that sang these songs that reminds me of something I heard David Francie say that we think of these songs now as traditional songs, of, you know, uh, Willie going off to fight Napoleon and never coming back and that kind of thing. But back then, that was just what was going on. It was, it was sort of the current events. And so from that point of view, I yeah. think, you know, you're, you're, you're referring to it as a fake folk song, but you're, you're continuing in that tradition of sort of, 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 of describing a story. Yeah, I mean, in the, that particular song was um, it was kind of inspired by a, a character that I knew from my childhood, um, somebody that I had seen when I went to visit my grandmother in uh, the north of Scotland, somebody who I'd seen walking through the village muttering to herself. And, you know, who knows what her story was, but I thought she deserved one. And uh, it was not long, you know, I grew up not long after the Second World War. And uh, so there were a lot of damaged people in, in all communities right across uh, Great Britain and elsewhere, of course, in Europe at that time. And, um, you know, physically damaged people, I think, got a lot more uh, sympathy than people whose damage was more in their, in their mind. And I, I, you know, I wondered if that was the reason. Perhaps she had lost somebody or, you know, who knows. That was the other theme that jumped out to me on the album and I suppose sort of very fitting because it is a folk music album, music of, of the folk. And, and you know, two of your songs, Daft Danny, we've talked about, but The Misfit as well, that there's, um, there's an, a theme around, you know, almost outsider status um, or standing outside of, power structures and, and saying, well, either that doesn't work for me, and so I'm going to push back on it, or I have no choice, I ha just have to be part of this system, but the song is a lament and a complaint about what's really going on. So that's an interesting thread as well. I don't know whether that was, again, you know, deliberate or whether that's just intrinsic in, in this music. Not really a deliberate thre thread, but yeah, I think it's, it's, part, it's a part and parcel of the, of the traditional canon you know it's that's the way it is one of the songs that popped out to me was the volunteer which i believe uh was a richard perry or david perry sorry set to music but it's an old poem by robert service and the whole first few verses well pretty much all the verses this guy is is expressing that he doesn't want to go to this war he doesn't believe in in, in going into the first world war and yet in the very last few lines he he goes he agrees to to enlist and I thought that was interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, I, and I know that Britain never had conscription during the First World War, but from what I understand, if if a, if a young man didn't go, like no woman would ever want to look at him, and he was really um, sort of cast out of uh, of of any social circle. Um, and it just kind of makes me think about where where we are nowadays, and 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 how society has sort of shifted in some ways. Um, this, this might be a little long-winded, but on, on you know, one hand, looking back on on the circumstances around World War One, I, I find it truly sickening that that say the Kaiser is related to the the British monarchy at the time, and these guys are playing a, a game of chess with with millions of people, and and the the damage that that caused to to those young men, but also to the families, to all, to all the loved ones, and that kind of thing, and um, and I, I can see that a lot of the the power structures were really capitalizing on the sentiment that people had. Um, to further their gains, but it kind of makes me feel that nowadays we, we've gone so far from there that the the concept of volunteering to fight for somebody else's freedoms somewhere else in the world it seems very alien to to my generation. I think 
And just thinking of what's currently going on around the world right now, we're, we're seeing a situation on, on the Ukrainian border that's very, very frightening, very, very sort of menacing. And what we're seeing right now is, you know, countries, and of course, nobody wants to go to war, nobody wants to start another war, but, you know, threatening economic sanctions. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a very different, a very different mindset. I mean, the, the the first world war there, it was the era of the the white feather campaign, where you know if you were a man of military age who was walking around without a uniform on, uh, a woman would come up to you and pin a white feather to your chest uh, to show that you were a coward, you know, and that certainly. I'm sure that's what, you know, what happened or what inspired Robert Service to write that uh, particular poem that we were talking about. Um, yeah, it's you know it's a different different uh, time, and you know, I don't know whether it's better or worse. In some ways, it's better. Some ways, it's not <laughs> not as good. And uh, but that's the way you know pe pe people don't fight wars now from you know trenches. They they fight them from offices in front of computers. Now, Ian, I'm curious uh, to hear a bit more about your journey from, from your earliest memories of, of hearing folk music to becoming a, an active participant and to, uh, to you coming over to Canada and being, parts of, uh, being a part of Friends of Fiddler's Green and, and other groups. All right, I'll try and give you the Coles notes, but um, I, I started out uh, as a teenager. I, I learned guitar for a while, and I was very fascinated with the American folk invasion that was happening in England at the time. Um, you know, Pete Seeger and Joan Byers and uh, Tom Paxton, uh, Carolyn Hester, lo lots of people were coming over and, and actually filling the Albert Hall and, and, you know, doing these huge concerts. I mean, it was the one time, you know, we call it the folk scare. It was the one time that folk music actually overlapped with popular music and, uh, and actually got into the charts. And for a while, I, you know, I thought folk music was an American phenomenon. I thought that was what it was. Uh, even though as a child, I had been taken to Cecil Sharp House in London by my um, grade school music teacher, Miss Jones, um, who, and you know, she she used to teach us bowdlerized versions of of English folk songs, um, but that was kind of different in the past. So I wasn't even thinking of that. And then one day, um, I was out, uh, actually on a pub crawl with a bunch of friends uh, in Hertfordshire, and we stopped at a at a, a few uh, nice country pubs, and we ended up in a little pub in St Albans, which is in Hertfordshire, just north of London. Um, beautiful old Roman town, and actually has the oldest pub in the in the the country as well, supposedly. Um, and uh, we were sitting there having a drink in the in the front lounge of of the the goat inn, as it was called. And I needed, I was taken short. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I walked down the corridor towards the gents at the back. And as I was walking down, I heard this music coming from upstairs and um, I didn't know what it was. It was kind of, <laughs> ironically, it was sort of exotic to me. I, you know, I, I had never heard anything quite like this. It was, a, it was somebody singing a, a really odd, to me anyway, modal me melody. It turned out to be Maddie Pryor um, and uh, it, it, Maddie and uh, Tim Hart, her partner at the time, who later became part of uh, Steel Eye Span, uh, founded Steel Eye Span, really. Um, they were resident singers at the St. Albans Folk Club, which just happened to be in this pub that I had visited quite accidentally. And uh, so I, I ended up going upstairs. It was just, uh, it was so, you know, it drew me upstairs, uh, the, the, the sound of, of Maddie singing. And um, I paid my five shillings or whatever it was to get in and really never looked back after that. I, I went every Sunday and uh, I uh, eventually was asked to be a resident singer myself at the club. Uh, there was about uh, there was about five or six of us who were resident singers. Tim and Maddie were two of them. Um, Brian Pearson, who wrote that song that you're talking about, uh, about death, Dead Funny, uh, he was one of them, and his partner at the time was the great English singer Frankie Armstrong. Um, and so I was suddenly, you know, <laughs> I was suddenly dropped into this quite amazing group of singers, and uh, you know, got to know them quite well. And 
and became a resident singer, which means that you are the MC for an evening and you sing, a, you get a chance to sing a few songs and then you introduce the guest, then you introduce the floor singers and you, you're basically running the evening. And so I got to see some of the really great touring performers as well, because the club used to book uh, all the, the top names. And it was just an amazingly influential time for me. And And then when I left there and came to Canada, I thought that I was giving up all that. I, you know, I'd been offered this job and I really, really wanted to get out of London. I was just sick of the place. And uh, so I took the job thinking that maybe I'd be in Canada for a couple of years. And uh, in fact, I got married and then, <laughs> and then came over. Uh, Val and I came over here and, um, and, and we just, uh, arrived and we were here for maybe a few months and discovered the Fiddler's Green Folk Club in uh, in Toronto and there was another you know epiphany we sudden I, I suddenly realized that actually there was an audience for English song in uh, in this part of the world so that's where it kind of went from there wow. and that hope sorry, that wasn't too long <laughs> oh no no I, I want to hear more actually I was, I was just going to ask how how did that folk club sort of uh, compared to, to what was going on uh, in, in the London folk clubs at the time? Well, it was different in, in you know, clearly it was more more eclectic. Uh, there was a, a mixture of, <laughs> I mean, I have to say it, there was a mixture of uh, American, British, and maybe a little Canadian song going on at that time. There wasn't, uh, there, there wasn't much interest in, in uh, apart from the, the Canadian singer-songwriters who were there, there wasn't much interest in Canadian uh, traditional music mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was just a very it was great I was just influenced by an awful lot of people and of course the Mariposa Folk Festival was in its heyday at that point as well and the, the club and the festival had a lot of kind of connections people who worked for both organizations or worked in both organizations and um, it, again, it was just enormously influential. I just saw so much different music, and it got me. I, I guess it kind of it kind of shaped what I wanted to be as a singer. And, and James, I know your your brother also uh, plays folk music. How how did you get into this whole crazy world? Because you've worked with everyone. Oh, <laughs> um, that's it was. Um... Fairly, uh, yeah, it's really through Peter, my brother Peter, um, introduced me because he's more, um, you know, he's eight or nine, nine years older than me. And he was, um, he left the house when I was still pretty young and moved to Toronto, went to university. And he was probably down at the same club hanging out. And he, uh, he brought home like lots of records. Like I was saying, I remember hearing, you know, his records of the Newport Folk Festival from back then, hearing, you know, Mississippi John Hurt and uh, Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. Um, my dad was a diplomat, so we lived abroad, but Peter would stay here. So he would actually came to Pakistan when I was a kid, when I was eight, and brought like that album, uh, Burl Ives and the Beach Boys. And that was kind of... Uh, my introduction to I, I didn't really differentiate between any of them at that time it was just all music and Peter played a lot of uh, you know he played guitar and sang and uh, I was studying you know early violin lessons and he would always encourage me just to play along with them so I think that was a huge influence for me just that someone was and I would just make stuff up and he was very uh, very generous about it so I'm quite grateful to have had that in my family like have someone and at the same time, my mother was very musical and really wanted me to do classical violin, uh, which I, I tried. I gave it a shot, but i not really cut out for it, it turns out. So, and then I started playing more um, in rock bands. I played a lot of electric bass um, and got into production through that, playing in sort of different bands, doing original music, more as a bass player. And then somehow the two worlds started to meld um, I started playing with more singer songwriters and playing, um, getting more and more interested in f traditional fiddling, which I'm still pretty interested in. Um, so all these things, you know, they are, have shaped my whole approach. And I think, I guess through my family, I was really used to the idea that different styles have 
very different parameters and you have to respect them, you know, like that. This is what makes a style. And so I've kind of learned to be curious about what, uh, you know, what it is that makes what somebody does work and what the operating rules are, if you will. And, you know, when it's good to break the rules and, you know, just all these sort of things that you learn from playing and listening to a bunch of different music. So I wouldn't say I, I ever had an epiphany, really. It was just always there and kind of one of always bubbling with all the other stuff. Um, yeah. And I think at a certain point I got sick of trying to, <laughs> I used to be to spend more time writing songs for a band I was in, Fat Man Waving, and we had a record deal and all that stuff. And it really went south in a sort of typically bad record company way um, where we no longer owned our music and they didn't want to have anything to do with us anymore. So I think that kind of, I just really liked the whole community around folk music way better. The people weren't all, you know, hankering to be stars all the time. And then I just, uh, you know, it's not to say there are no egos in folk music, but I just found generally the environment more uh, welcoming, inclusive. And I really love, still love that about it. As we often say about sea shanties that there are, you know, tens of dollars to be made. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if we might uh, might convince you to sing us another song. About uh, all things are quite silent. Okay. Will that be good? Yeah. yeah. This is uh, it's actually an appropriate song because it's uh, it's about a press gang, and um, uh, it's essentially it 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 it's a song that I got from uh, from Louis Killen, the aforementioned Louis Killen, and um, it. It describes uh, uh, a couple who are um, making love when they are they're interrupted by uh, a bunch of ruffians uh, who turn out to be a press gang, and they drag uh, the poor guy off to join the navy, uh, leaving the woman behind. It's very much of a woman's song, uh, but it's got it's an absolutely beautiful melody. It's it's actually the first song in the first edition of the Penguin Book of English Folk Songs. Uh, mainly because it starts with an A, <laughs> but but it's a great song. All things are quite silent, each mortal at rest. When me and my true love got snug in one nest When a bold set of ruffians they entered our cave And they called my dear jewel to plough the salt wave I begged hard for my true love as though I begged for life They'd not listen to me although a, a fond wife Saying the king he needs sailors to the sea he must go and they left me lamenting in sorrow and woe. Through green fields and meadows we oft times did walk, and sweet conversations of love we have taught And the small birds in the woodland so sweetly did sing And the young thrushes' voices made the valleys to ring Although my love's gone, I will not be cast down Who knows when my true love may someday return And will make me amends for all sorrow and strife And my true love and I will live happy for life. 
Oh, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you have to admire the optimism of the uh, of the author of that song at the end there. <laughs> so I, I suspect that was very seldom what how these things actually played out. So I was going to say, I'd like to go back to a couple of the themes we were speaking about just before as well. Um, and I'm reminded of a few years ago, I was in San Francisco and I was playing a gig that night and I needed to buy some guitar strings. So I Googled music store and it brought me to uh, what turned out to be a, a record store. So I walked in there uh, and I started chatting with the guy working behind the, the counter and he asked me where I was from. I said, Toronto, Canada. And he said, oh, I was thinking of moving up there a while ago. And I was thinking, why would you want to leave California to come up to Toronto? Nothing against Toronto or anything, but just why would you want to leave? And he said, well, there was this thing called the Vietnam War going on, you know, and I realized, oh, right. Yeah, there, there were a fair number of uh, draft dodgers that, that came up up here. And anyhow, I started sort of looking around the, the record store and I found um, a lot of amazing folk music. I, I found some La Batine Souriant, uh, Quebec band, uh, Chieftains. And then one of the records I found too here was... Uh, Friends of Fiddler's Green. <laughs> so I was very surprised to find that. It looks like, I think that's you there, Ian. Uh, yeah, looking I'm like you're going back. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk about a little bit about, um, I mean, my goodness, the 1960s, 1970s, there's a, a lot of uh, political movements going on and folk music mm -hmm. seemed to reemerge around that time. And, and it, it seems to be very linked to that. So um, another angle that I'm sort of exploring here too is you mentioned bands like Steel Eye Span and you know American bands like the Birds were fusing rock music with country and bluegrass and folk music. I'm kind of curious about yeah. what what did that feel like to to you guys being here in Canada and um you know sort of having a foot in the the tradition from the, the British Isles but also in North America with the American influence going on with the Canadian influences. Yeah, well, first of all, um, my early uh, uh, exposure to f uh, the Fiddler's Green Folk Club, um, I met a, a lot of draft dodgers. Um, there was a, quite an American, old-timey American scene going on. And there were several uh, folks in 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 that uh, in those bands who were were draft dodgers who had come up to, to escape the draft. Um, so... It was strange to me, uh, having just arrived from England and having not ever been in a war. I mean, I, I narrowly uh, escaped the Second World War by about three years. Um, but it was very strange to me to meet um, guys of my own age and with my own interests and, and all that who uh, could easily be sent off to die in Vietnam. And, and that, I mean, that was, it was really an eye-opener for me. Um, uh, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, as far as as far as the uh, the folk rock phenomenon was concerned, um, I was around uh, you know at the beginning of of the of Steel Eye Span. I didn't really know Fairport as well or any of the people in it, um, but I do remember one evening at uh, the St Albans Folk Club uh, when Tim Hart and Maddie Pryor turned up at the folk club with Ashley Hutchins in tow. And Ashley Hutchins was um, carrying a uh, stand-up bass. He had this big bass fiddle with him. And I'd never seen a bass fiddle on a folk song, a, a folk club uh, stage before. And uh, and everybody else in the audience was kind of looking at themselves and looking at each other and you know muttering, oh, this isn't folk music, you know, all this kind of stuff. And uh, so they, they got up and they did they they did a set and it was it was kind of interesting. I hadn't really heard anything like this before. I mean, I'd heard Tim and Maddie many times together, but this ad addition of even uh, an acoustic stand up bass um, just brought a new dimension to the whole thing. So um, I was I mean quite a fan in the early days of uh, of Steel Eye Span and uh, I. <laughs> It was strange because at that time, uh, in my experience of the English folk scene, there were sort of two camps. It was a bit split. Uh, on the one side, there was kind of the Merry England crowd, you know, the the um, the imaginary village, I suppose you you might you might call it, and that's not my phrase. Um, and and then on the other side, there was there was the more hardcore political uh, scene where people were actually writing songs as well as singing. Um, you know, industrial songs from the north of England, real hard, hard, hard nosed kind of labor songs and stuff like that. 
and those two camps were were only kind of coming together occasionally in in places like the folk club where where I started and so I was influenced by both of them uh, but you know I, I later on in life I became a Morris dancer so that's definitely sort of merit on the merry England side of things but at the same time I'm quite political and even my Morris team is quite political um, they they always describe themselves as a, a anarchic, anarchic anarchic syndicalist cooperation cooperative or something like I can't remember the exact phrase but um, they were all a bunch of lefties um, anyway I, I digress um, going back to, uh, to the folk music the folk rock scene um, I, I was very very much uh, a fan of, of um, uh, both uh, Fairport and Steel Ice Ban um, for a while and uh, after a while, I kind of went, I just, I sort of got drawn back to the more basic stuff. Uh, I don't know why, it was just more, more interesting to me. Um, and later in life, I actually talked to some of the people who were involved in, in that. And one of them was Martin Carthy, actually. And I, I asked him, I said, Martin, when you look back now, you know, 20, 25 years or whatever it was at the time, uh, to your involvement in Steel Eye Span, you know, how does it sound to you? And he said, well, it sounds like 70s music. And, and I thought that was quite telling because um, the one great thing about folk music is that it's timeless. You know, uh, these songs seem to have some relevance no matter what, at what point in the, you know, the time continuum you, you are singing them. Um, but just the sound to Martin, you know, when he, I mean, I, I'm sure he was quite fond of them in a way, but he said they, they sound like they're, they're still stuck in the 70s. And I, and I think that's true. And, uh, and I think in some ways people now look back on them as a kind of a, um, a sort of anachronism in a way, but a very nice anachronism. You know, it was a period that I think a lot of us look back very fondly to but it's it's just not the same anymore it's just it just doesn't seem quite as relevant i don't know does that answer any of your questions <laughs> it, it answers many of them yeah um i'm curious yeah. to hear a little bit more about the formation of uh the friends of fiddler's screen um and and maybe how the the roster kind of changed over the years um one of one of the reasons i'm interested in, in this uh, aside from from your involvement of course is um, the first band I played with was uh, with Duncan Cameron, and I believe his father, Stuart, was in the band for, for a while as well. Yes, he was. Uh, I, I don't remember at what I'm point... Just going to, I'm just going to put a lot more logs on the fire. Okay. Yeah, it's quite cold in here. <laughs> um, yeah, Stuart uh, was an early member of, of the Friends of Fiddler's Green, and um, he only left the band, I think, because uh, he, he moved up to uh, Sudbury to, to take a job at the uh, Science North Museum there. Um, uh, great singer, and a really interesting singer, because uh, Stuart was very scared. Scottish in a way his parents were Scottish and he was I mean he was definitely Canadian but he had this he was a real Scottophile and uh, and he sang with the Scottish accent and he sang a lot of Scottish songs um, but he was also a huge Bob Dylan fan and uh, the really really strange thing was that he would sing Bob Dylan songs with a Scottish accent too he'd sing them really well and 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 the songs would go over brilliantly but uh, but it would just you know it was it was one really interesting thing about him. Um, he was he was a great singer and and uh, you know we we lost him way too early unfortunately. Uh, after, you know some years after he moved up to Sudbury, um, he uh, got cancer and, and and passed away, and uh, a very sad loss. You know the first the first of uh, the friends of Fiddler's Green that that we lost. And Duncan and Moira, his uh, two, two kids, um, are both uh, musicians. Moira is a ballad singer. She lives up in uh, um, the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife, I think. 
And, uh, and Duncan, of course, has become uh, quite a big uh, traditional singer, fiddle player, and uh, a great musician uh, in and around Ontario and probably other places too. I don't see an awful lot of him, but uh, it's really nice to see the way he's developed as a, as a musician. So I'm curious about how, how the group formed. I'm, I'm gathering that it um, is, is through that, that folk club, the, the Fiddler's Green Folk Club. Um, but how did that sort of evolve and progress over the years? It kind of formed uh, because we were all in the same room. I mean, that's basically, we, you know, there was, no, there was no master plan behind the whole thing. Um, we, we just, uh, we were all, uh, we all sang at Fiddler's Green from time to time, either as the you know, the invited guest or as just part of the house band or just, you know, just as a floor singer. And uh, we all got to know each other really well. There were, uh, there were several British expatriates, uh, Tam Kearney, Jim Strickland, uh, myself, uh, later on David Parry and, and um, on Alistair Brown, um, all from, uh, from across the pond. Um, and, you know, all of us interested in British traditional music in particular, but with an open ear to other kinds of traditional music too. And, uh, and I think uh, we just, we just kind of gravitated together and then we discovered that actually we could play some tunes together. And so the Friends formed not really as a band in the conventional sense, but as a sort of a traveling gig, you know, a traveling folk festival, if you like, where we would all just and we still do this. We, we sit down in a row on stage and none of us knows really what's going to happen. Um, none of us really knows what the other members of the band are going to sing. And we, we basically have a sing around. We join in where appropriate and sometimes we're not appropriate. And uh, um, it, just, it just kind of developed. Anyway, right. So, <laughs> so, so, so. Oh, well, we have just. I was born of Jordy parents one day when I was young. That's how the Jordy dialect became my native. I was a pretty baby, my mother she went bow. She tickled me, she cuddled me, I wish she'd do it now. So uh, each performance is different, each performance is uh, unexpected, you know, has unexpected moments. Um, we, we had a couple of really good joke tellers in the, in the band, which I think always helps to move things along. And... Uh, yeah, the band just kind of evolved over the years, and we we lost some people and we we gained some people over the years. I mean, our latest <coughs> addition is great. I mean, when Tam Kearney passed away a few years ago, uh, for the last little while he was uh, having trouble playing uh, guitar, and so we hired. First of all, we hired Ian Ian Clark, uh, who lives here in <coughs> excuse me, who lives here in Ottawa. Uh, great guitar player and uh, and Scottish as well, so he kind of fitted in rather well. Um, and then when Ian uh, decided he couldn't do it anymore, um, we uh, got hold of Ian Bell, who is just you know a, a perfect uh, match for the rest of the the band. Um, you know, great songwriter, great musician, and um, just a all <laughs> he's kind of an all round uh, uh, Renaissance man. I mean, a wonderful. Uh, visual artist too just a really creative guy and and a lot of fun to be with and that that i think is the most important thing about the friends of fiddler's green um you know i was just saying the other day uh, just a, a couple of days ago uh, i don't know if you know this but caroline parry um david parry's widow uh passed away um just a couple of days ago and his kids uh evelyn and richard 
uh, Richard Reed Parry, um, are both in Ottawa at the moment. And I went to see them last night and I just realized how much uh, we are all family in the Friends of Fiddler's Green. You know, all, all our kids know each other. And uh, it's just, you know, most of us are uh, immigrants originally. And, and so having a family on this side of the pond is just a huge um, advantage and, and, you know, and a huge blessing for, for all of us, I think. So it's more than a band, let's put it that way. <laughs> I think that shows up in, in the room as well. I mean, I've been going to Friends of Fiddler's Green concerts for as long as I can really remember. And that when you described it as a sing-around on stage, it's you know, the sing-around's also happening in the room, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, a shanty that's being sung or, or take your garbage when you go at the end of the night, um, in, 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 in Tam's memory. But, um, so, you know, it's, it, it, it begs the question, you know, uh, to what degree then have, have shanties played a, a, a role in, in, in that sort of, in the way that you approach, you know, singing and creating that atmosphere with, with an audience. Uh, and just, uh, by way of context, you know, we've, we've spoken to people who, you know, for them, shanties is about, you know, they came into it because they love the sea music or the history or, or whatever. But most people seem to come into it without even realizing that this is a body of work songs or whatever. These are just great songs to sing. And so I'm wondering sort of where on the spectrum uh, you've fallen. Well, I've, I've always loved the idea of being able to draw an audience in on, on a, a song like a shanty. And I mean, shanties, you know, they vary, obviously, in the amount of audience participation. But so many of them, uh, you know, the audience is singing almost as much as the guy who's leading the song. And, and that's a, a really big thing. I, you know, I think um, people have found a lot of comfort in, in participatory music over the last few years and the last couple of years particularly where the you know people do zoom singing sessions and stuff like that um which is difficult it's not easy to do that and uh it's not quite the same as being in the same room as as somebody but just creating that that uh that community by singing together i think has become perhaps more important than it ever was uh, i mean for me i'm a total landlubber or I've, you know, I, I actually came over, I sailed over the Atlantic when I first emigrated, but I never want to do that again. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really very much uh, a land-based person, and but I'm interested in sea songs. I'm interested in sea lore, and and the the shanties, as as I said earlier, you know, a lot of them are just, and as you mentioned, uh, Stefan, they're just great songs. They have really, really good. Um, melodies and they're they're really accessible. The melodies are accessible, and and the the um, call and response kind of pattern of the thing is is accessible. You know, an audience can learn how to sing along with a shanty in five seconds flat. It's uh, they're just they're really great. They're a great device for anybody who sings traditional music uh, to bring to draw an audience in. Following the last uh, the last the official Christmas Day in the in the Ukrainian tradition, a friend of mine, John David Williams, and myself found ourselves at another bloody folk club, which is uh, Stefan's parents' folk club that they've been running for for God knows how long now. Um, and it was my first time attending. And Ian, I believe you were performing that evening, and I just remember walking in and standing by the bar, and just being in awe of of that surround sound sing that I had never seen anywhere else in in canada to be honest and it, it just felt like walking into a a warm hug you know and i just remember sitting there with john or standing there with john and just being just floored just floored by the atmosphere and uh ian there's one song you did in particular i think it was something about like the broken token And that one in particular just had me pretty choked up. So I just want to say uh, thank you very much. And thank you to Stefan's parents. And um, what a wonderful community that, that they've built over the years. And, and I feel so happy to have been able to 
to be a small part of it. Yeah, they're a, they're a great bunch of singers, and uh, I always enjoy uh, performing for them. It's great. So, uh, Ian and James, before we say goodbye, um, can you tell us a little bit? You know, where can people find out more, uh, buy the album, um, and support you guys? Um, well, uh, the album is uh, for sale at uh, uh, ianrob.com, www.ianrob.com, and um, uh, we're hoping to get back into you know doing some gigs. We've got we've got a gig in Eganville, Ontario, coming up in in April, uh, April the 9th, I think, for uh, for the uh, off off the off the grid productions uh, people up there, um, and you know as soon as this whole covid nonsense dies down a little bit and let's hope it does soon um it would be nice to get out and uh get around the province at least a little bit uh and uh, do do some some concerts so that's what we're kind of looking at in uh in the future um in, meanwhile you know the, if you if you want to go go to my website and buy the cd um uh, there's some really good songs on there i think <laughs> Well, if it's if it's any temptation, uh, I know that another bloody folk club is uh, most likely going to be moving to the premises of a brewery uh, up near High Park. So uh, hopefully we can uh, we can tempt you into into that. Twist your rubber arm, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be tough, but I think I can manage it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you Would you mind taking us out with with a song? Um, I think you'd mentioned maybe doing Bold Riley, and I know that. Uh, you mentioned the liner notes. I thought this was really interesting to the album that um, increasingly this song occurs to you as a little bit of a, 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 a almost a memorial song for, for people we've lost. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that's just uh, probably because of my age. But um, yeah, there's been a number of, uh, we've lost a, a number of people over the last couple of years and uh, it seems to have cropped up, this song. Uh, not, not always sung by me, but by other people too, I, Alistair Brown I, sings it a lot. I know, and uh, it just seems like an appropriate thing. It's a sailor's farewell, essentially, um, and it's uh, again another one with a, a great course. So here it is. <clears throat> oh, the rain it rains all day long. Bold Riley, oh, bold Riley. And that northern wind, it blows so strong. Old Riley O has gone away. Goodbye, me darling. Goodbye, me dear old. Old Riley O, old Riley. Goodbye, me darling. Goodbye, me dear old, old Riley O has gone away. We're outward bound for the Bengal Bay, old Riley O, old Riley. Track onward, lads, it's a hell of a way. Old Riley O has gone away. Goodbye, me darling. Goodbye, me dear old. Old Riley O, old Riley. Goodbye, me darling. Goodbye, me dear old. A glum, old Riley, old, old Riley. Come white stocking day, you'll be drinking rum. Old Riley, old, has gone away. Goodbye, me darling. Goodbye, me dear. Bye, me 
zero. Bold Riley, oh, the owner's gone away. Oh, Riley, Riley, where are you? Bold Riley, oh, Bold Riley. Oh, Riley's gone and I'm going to. Well, that was really interesting. I, I feel we touched on a lot of topics that we don't normally do or we don't normally get to. Yeah, I mean, like, as, you, as you said off the top, right? I mean, when we're talking about the political ramifications and, and, and power dynamics and all of this and the way that that informs folk music, I think it's just mm. yeah, really, really fascinating stuff. And look, I could also just listen to Ian and James play music all day, every day. Yeah, they're fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, if you uh, if you liked what you heard from Ian and James, we're going to put all the information uh, in the show notes. Um, really just would encourage you to to pick up the album. It is obviously the you know the best way to directly support these artists is to buy their music from them. Um, mm -hmm. They also have a ton of stuff on 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 YouTube. Um, so, you know, whatever way you're able to support them, um, it will go a long way. Uh, and speaking of that, if you like what we're doing here on The Shanty Show, please hit the like and subscribe button, uh, leave us a review, leave us a comment. Um, the way that this works, right, the, the more people who hit those buttons, the thumbs up and the subscribe, the more likely it is that it's going to pop up through the algorithm and somebody else who's out in the world looking to hear a little bit more about shanties uh, is going to find this. So when we say that it helps, it, it really does help. And it's a small thing you can do to help ensure the success of the show and that we get, keep getting to uh, to do this and to, to keep bringing great guests uh, on here to talk about how they think about music and how they think about about shanties. Thank you so much for spending time with us uh, here. If you are listening to this only, um, check out the YouTube channel because uh, I, I, I don't know. I think the the visual element to some of these shows and and what we're doing now with splicing in some videos and some photos, you know, it's, it's just a little bit more dynamic and and you never know. You might enjoy the format. So with that, thank you so much for lending us your ears, lending us your eyeballs. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye. When your forests turn to ash, when your fields all turn to dust, when your island are awash, how will you choose, who will you trust? And when the mudslides turtle down, who will you turn to for recourse? When your greens all fade to brown, who will you blame, who will you curse? And will you go to church to pray? Leaving your children to a tongue This world you've left in disarray It's not God's work It is your own When tornadoes wreck your town When the tempest scours your coast 
Will you still heed the orange clown? Will you still cheer his every boast? And when it's time to make your choice, whose truth, whose lies will you believe? Will you ignore the praying voice? Will you refuse to be deceived? Or will you go to church to pray? Leaving your children to atone This world you've left in disarray Is not God's work It is your own Christians all awake, fight the tide or surely drown, for your blessed children's sake, drive away the orange cloud. For when at last the seas run dry, and when rocks melt in the sun, and when you can no more deny, then what you have done then will you go to church to pray leaving your children to atone this world you've left in disarray is not God's work it is your own then will you go to church to pray leaving your children to atone this world you've left in disarray is not God's work. It is your own. It's not God's work. It is your own.